A big welcome to Prince Constantin to be at a speak Corp event marked by businesses that are uh, trying to improve uh, the world and also in your position uh, as a startup envoy for the Startup Delta. Special envoy for the Startup Whatever. Delta. Yeah. <laughs> With uh, entrepreneurs uh, trying to tackle global problems. And I thought the first question should be about Startup Delta and then I thought actually we should maybe we should consider these chairs. <laughs> what do you think? Are they comfortable? So far. Yeah? <laughs> so far. Well, they're office chairs, right? They force you to sit. Office chairs, yeah. yes. Yeah, they're good. But there's wood in there, too. I don't know there's if these... Wood. Yes. If we get these out of the canals, too. I think uh, we'd have to ask. Yeah. But I'd say these are comfortable chairs, so there's a bit of promotion. Um, yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the Startup Delta and what the aims are for Startup Delta? Right, so basically, it's an organization set up first by the government, and then we took it out of the government, so now it's public-private partnership to enhance entrepreneurship actually for rapid growth companies in the Netherlands. Rapid growth companies and startups yes. uh, in general. So startups, but you know, you get into semantics about what is a startup, what is a scale up. You know, it's really about companies that have the ambition to grow fast and therefore need the financing, need a certain kind of regulatory context, need talent, which mostly international, and needs to uh, internationalize from uh, from a very early phase. And uh, maybe some people know, but initially it was set up by Nelly Cruz, yep. uh, who is also a power woman and a Dutch politician who was the European, uh, the EU, EU commissioner for the digital agenda. Yep. And uh, two years ago, I think you took over from her uh, as special envoy. And I'm curious, what does special envoy mean? What, is the, what are the tasks involved? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it, it means representing, obviously, um, the Netherlands, in our, but actually I took it into a different direction. I think uh, we are basically a service company for, for everyone who has the ambition to kind of drive entrepreneurship and support the cause that is uh, um, help entrepreneurs internationalize, grow, attract capital. So we're working with the government, we're working with private entities, we're working with investors, founders, and uh, it's connecting them to, to international networks, providing access to, uh, to all the inputs that they basically need, and also telling the story a bit about what's going on in the Netherlands, because that again helps uh, to put a bit of Dutch in the whole world of startups. So an, an ambassador role as well as more an active role of connecting... Uh... Yeah, I don't, I don't like the ambassador idea because I don't know what I'm representing anyway right. so if it's uh, I'm not I'm not elected by the startups I'm I'm not a, I'm not representing the government per se I'm a partner to the government so I don't really know who I'm a, who I'm an ambassador for or to because I, I read somewhere that you were taking over in May 2016 for 18 months yeah. but it's definitely more than 18 months ago so there must be something that you're enjoying about oh, it's the best role. job it's the best <laughs> job there is so uh, no I, I took it for for one half year with the with the opportunity to to extend it for another one half year depending on if the first half, one and a half year were uh, relatively successful and uh, I'm sorry it was extended and you say it's the best job in the world can you tell us a little bit about what is a, a nice experience that you had or, or startups that you work with well, it's, it, there's no, I don't think there are many jobs in the world where you get to, uh, to talk to entrepreneurs who work with them, actually do something that's concrete and not just talk about policy. Or uh, I used to be very much involved in policy and influencing and in research, uh, consulting. You're always hoping that somebody else does something. So you're advising somebody to do things. You're trying to create a framework in which change happens. Here, actually, that, well, actually at the European Commission, I found that I was spending about 80% of my time trying to convince people to do things that they didn't want to do. So we had incumbents, we had our own civil servants that were not particularly helpful at some times. We had the member states that didn't want anything to happen. You had the parliament that had very different opinions. So basically, you're just working your way around obstacles. And I thought, why am I doing this? Why am I getting good at this? I don't want to be this. So uh, working with entrepreneurs that actually have an idea and that actually execute, uh, even though uh, the path to their execution is completely hopeless, but they are so <laughs> focused that they get there and they actually prove that it's possible that I found was very powerful um, so and then I'm working with politicians with, at a local level uh, you know, which I really like because they are often much more engaged um, they they actually know what they're what they what they're doing it is not abstract it's not statistics it's actually they still go to schools they still see can look in the eyes of of a migrant and, and still see the human side of things so we're working with local governments then you have the accelerators that are working with all of these uh, these companies that come through from all over the world that come here want to establish themselves here 
here. Uh, and we're working with the entrepreneurs. So we go to places like uh, CES Las Vegas or South by Southwest or, um, or Computex recently in Taiwan, and we help entrepreneurs connect with the relevant networks and people. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a great job to see that you can actually provide some help. So there's a lot of good energy and active yep. uh, um, uh, doing mentality. Nice. And, and if we go back to uh, the Netherlands, and we're sitting in a, quite an old building, a small seafaring nation that made well global impact with its uh, attitude of trade and entrepreneurialism. Do you think that that's a good breeding ground and why the Netherlands is a startup place? Or are there also other reasons why this is a great place for startups? Yeah, I, I, yes, it's a trading nation, and yes, it's entrepreneurial. I think what, what's uh, what's what's a lot of bad things happen because of that too, right? So it's uh, it's not always that the, the the imprint has been fantastic of that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we've been relatively explored, exploitative uh, as well. So I, I don't think that kind of history is the one. At least is one that we should learn from. Now, I think what what is typical about the Netherlands, and that's through through the ages, it was the first republic in say the modern modern European history. Uh, it's now it's a monarchy, but after monarchy went out of fashion, they started beheading peoples. We became a monarchy, so it's a kind of it's always a bit of a counterintuitive there. Um, the um, the, the, the Netherlands has this kind of attitude or people of always asking why. So always challenging the authority, challenging the status quo. And that helps if you want to be innovative. So it's, there's, uh, if somebody says, this is the way we do it, you know, that would work in a country, maybe in the US that works better, or in China, I say, this is the way you do it. Okay. Um, but here, everywhere, it's always someone who gets up and says, why, you know, which is very annoying for the boss, but it does help you kind of keep reconsidering the status quo. And I think that's so. That's really important. It does, however, mean that we Dutch, are, I think, are more concerned with the uh, the concept and the why, and we like to change things, and we like to kind of find a solution. Uh, and the challenge that I find in my job is the to the, how to go from that to execution and uh, and growth. Um, so we see many good ideas, many small companies selling out really early. You know, we have great technologies, but to build a company and go for all the boring stuff. Uh, you know, the HR troubles and uh, you know, all of that and, and build a big company like we've just recently seen with Adyen. There are not many people doing that. Yeah. No, it's not just, enough people. Not enough yeah. people. It's fine. Your, uh, your, your reference to why makes me think of my children. <clears throat> I'm married to an Englishman. He always says, why do you always negotiate with them? They're <laughs> always asking why. Why don't you just tell them to do as they're told? So it's a very, uh, uh, it, I can see that it starts young. Yep. Um, but you mentioned now Adyen. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the companies that you work with? What are the companies uh, that are you, that uh, have started here? Are they Dutch? Are they international? Yeah, we don't. I mean, very often you see that these teams are international, especially when they come through the accelerators. They uh, they recruit all across uh, the world. Um, so they and, and a company like Adyen, I think always started as international from day one. They uh, their language has always been English, even though they're based in Amsterdam. Uh, and they've always attracting international talent. And, and I think Atien is, a, is the payment It's a service. payment company, the IPO'd. And, uh, Everybody and, and, uses yeah. it in this room. You might not know yeah, it. Yeah, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. They know everything about you, but you don't know anything about them. That's, you know, the, um, but no, but they've been, they've been very focused and, uh, and they're very low key in that sense. They're quite, they're quite Dutch, actually. They don't want all the, the blah, blah. It's actually people like me that make all, all the blah, blah around them yeah. because we need them as role models. But they would prefer to just stay in the, in the shade under the radars. And um, to go back, I think, to the Netherlands, you said there's a long history. There's also, it's the first place where shares were issued and the, I, the, the concept of shareholder value came from, a, from an Anglo-Dutch perspective is, and has influenced, I think, the norms and the values in which the economic system is run uh, these days. But you also see a lot of uh, attitude, obviously. This room testifies uh, for that, that there's a changing attitude toward our current economic system being quite extractive. Um, and that we are all looking to work for an economy that works for everyone. And do you see that that attitude, in your perspective, do you see that attitude changing also with the entrepreneurs that you work with or the businesses? No, I don't see it changing. I'm seeing it as being part of the DNA. I don't, uh, and, and actually sometimes it's a problem. 
because right. in the I think in the Netherlands then you do good that's good enough and whereas I think if you want to do good at scale you have to also focus very much on the business and have a good business model because then you'll be able to deliver that and good, doing good like being an impact venture as an excuse not to be a successful uh, business or to just muddle along have low returns I don't think is is viable so um, but this this innate drive to do good is really strong with Dutch entrepreneurs. So if you compare that, I mean, if we go to to, to Las Vegas and you have a bit of the comparison between different uh, different countries, especially the US and, and Asia, I mean, the focus is very much on, on either on, the, in Asia, it's very much on the technology and in, in the US, it's really very much on making money. Um, and you actually have to have the kind of the combination of doing good, good technology, but also a drive to make money. And, uh, but I think I see that all across the board. We, when we look at where the Netherlands is trying to excel in, in applications like blockchain, it's not in the, in the ICO, the crypto side, it's very much in how do we apply blockchain for good. If we look at what, what, you know, where, where the government wants to go, it's always about um, its SDGs, it's about uh, how do we apply technology, how do we you know, build enterprises around that, the, the, the energy transition. So I think that's really the stuff that motivates entrepreneurs here. But I do think that many of the new entrepreneurs uh, are very, very focused on and, 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 and um, I say that motivated by, uh, by not doing bad at least and doing good preferably. And, uh, and you know, you can have discussion between the old comp company or the old economy companies that will be doing CSR, will be doing good on the side of their company. Whereas the new companies see that, well, we're not getting the staff, we can't work for a company like Patagonia if, if you don't have that kind of values. So um, I think um, having these, these uh, in your DNA that you should treat your people well, that you treat the planet well, when we know the, the PPPs, um, is, uh, is much more prevalent with the, with the startups than with the traditional companies. And uh, so, so you say that doing good is, uh, we, we talked about previously, uh, tech, tech for control, I think you said, in, uh, in Asia and tech for money, mm. maybe elsewhere, but that Europe is, is really looking at tech for good. Can you give some examples of, uh, of, of really models, I, I heard you say global challenges, Dutch solutions of entrepreneurs that are really good examples of doing good or really have it in their DNA? Yeah, so you have companies with like like um, uh, now we call them edge solutions, you know, that do um, completely uh, circular buildings. You think that the the cradle to cradle movement here in the Netherlands has been uh, very enthusiastically adopted. Um, and um, sorry, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I was. <laughs> yeah. I, no, no. Okay. That, no. So you. Um, and I was curious about what they did. Edge solutions. Oh, Edge Solutions, they built this, the, the, the Edge, and then now they are basically going from a, a basically building developer to providing the total software for creating uh, circular buildings. So uh, energy neutral, but also yeah. the, the reuse of water, the, the use of their materials, all that is really a, kind of a concept that they will be rolling out. Also in a pivot to, to go from a relatively capital intensive, slow uh, growth path uh, through actually doing the buildings to actually doing the, the inside of the buildings, which is actually much more scalable. Yeah. Nice. And um, uh, what I heard previously was also that, uh, uh, Ryan, you were saying a lot more CEOs are coming out to speak out uh, to what they stand for. Um, here we have 300, I think, businesses, uh, people in businesses who are uh, um, motivated to use their business as a force for good. They're a very diverse set of people from uh, manufacturing to looking at working conditions, uh, using blockchain technologies. Um, but they have that thing in common. Um, it is really an intrinsic motivation. So I also hear you say that, that a lot of entrepreneurs, do you see any other like driving forces that are moving this forward? I think we mentioned like employees or consumers are uh, important in, in moving toward a different economy. Yeah, I think consumers, or well, you know much better about consumers. Consumers are always a bit disappointing because they, uh, when they, in the end, they just, they just do cheap. Um, at least that's what you hear. I would still think if I look at uh, Unilever, a great company, but they still put everything in plastic bottles. And that's, you know, I'm still, my cart is still full of plastic. And it really annoys me when I'm in the supermarket and think, why didn't we solve this? And all the technologies are there. I mean, um, I went to um, a, a startup event organized by uh, by AXO, which is a Dutch uh, chemical company, 
and uh, and read the the solutions that were there to basically make plastics out of CO2, and you just cannot ima imagine what is possible. Uh, you think, you know, why are we still having these problems? And obviously, going from from a technology or a material into large scale production means investment. So, who is going to make the investment? Two is the final is the final uh, consumer actually going to pay for a bottle that's twice as expensive? Is L'Oreal going to pay for that? You know, so you you can provide your wonderful um, recyclable or your biodegradable uh, plastic, um, but if it costs a bit more money, um, you know, how do you get the consumer to to pay for that? So I think um, I think that is a that is a that is a challenge, yeah. and um, yeah. So um, but I, so consumers, I would know probably yes, but it's slow, and they're slowly going into also into into uh, biological products, and 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 now with blockchain, it's so much easier to actually um, make the supply chains much more transparent. So I think that will work. I think employees is really important. I think people are really motivated in that. We saw that with Paul Pullman. I think. Uh, if there's one thing that he does really well is positioning the company um, for as an attractive workplace for for uh, young talent that really wants to work for companies that do good, uh, and talent is the absolute bottleneck for for high growth. Um, so that's I think a really important driver. And then the, I mean just simple the government you know you set regulation no combu uh, internal combustion engine for cars in 2025. It's not difficult you know you can do it if obviously there are a lot of vested interest and so but that becomes a trade-off, and I think the government can do much, much more in setting norms than in uh, having all kinds of subsidy and investment programs. You can put, you can throw billions at this, but if you basically set a norm and say this is not going to happen anymore, then things will change. And you see, the yeah, I used to, at the European Commission, we were responsible for about one and a half billion in research funding of the total research packet of I think 18 billion or 12 billion a year. If you see how much money we were putting in in hydrogen technologies and all that. All that's available. It's on. It's but it's on the shelf because because the kind of the the the, the path of CO2 reduction or um, the energy yields of new fuels uh, was negotiated and it was negotiated at a at a at a trend which is much less ambitious than was actually possible. But we accepted that because there are many other interests that we want to serve. But if we really want to, we could be much more aggressive in those areas. Nice. And uh, one thing I, I don't hear is uh, investing in, impact in, uh, investing. Here with this uh, B Corp certification is really uh, um, looking at standards, so you, you certify yourself in that sense. And I spoke to somebody who said there's actually three things that the B Corp certification bring, which is one, a really strong community of like-minded people to cooperate. It's two, it's very attractive for uh, employees to come, but it also gives you uh, more variety on how to, uh, to attract investment, so impact investment. Do you see that a lot of impact investors are looking at uh, how they can get different kinds of returns? Yeah, sure. I think it's a maturing, uh, it's a maturing asset class, and I think, um, uh, but it's still there's no excuse for not building a really good, a good business. And uh, and yes, it might you, you know if you might expect to be paid in dividends except for a, a huge exit. You know? So there might be there are differences there in expectation. Also, as a part of your portfolio, if you uh, if you are a wealthy individual and you're part of your portfolio, you can just say instead of giving a lot of money to uh, to, to charity, I it kind of invested, and I don't expect uh, a full return, but I expect at least to do a lot of good with my money and uh, at impact. And uh, so maybe it's also managing the expectation. But I still think, on the whole, um, we a, a, a good you know a good company makes positive impact, and uh, and it also forces people to think much more intelligently about um, how products are designed, uh, what uh, how they uh, how they engage their supply chain. And um, and I think on the whole that is that just makes good business. So if you if you do it well, you should be able to attract um, um, substantial uh, sums of money. Take, for instance, um, a boy on slot with the ocean cleanup. It's not a business. It's a it was a brilliant it's a brilliant idea, and he's executing on it, and he does get money. So he understands he's not starting a business now. He's basically uh, he needs charity money, but he knows he knows how to attract it. But there is a business at the end, and he has that narrative. And if he would have just started and saying, I'm going to raise capital, it's like uh, you're going to raise venture capital, that wouldn't have worked. So you have to understand what kind of value you're producing, what your vehicle is, are you a company, or are you, are you basically just a project, or, and then what kind of funding comes with that? And it could be either charity, it could be, but it could be in sponsorship, could be CSR, but it could also be investment, because you actually do have a company. Yeah. 
And uh, what I notice is that uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, the B Corp calls themselves a movement of movement, so there's a lot of uh, purpose-driven entrepreneurs, but one of the things that are seemingly difficult is really how to measure impact, and that's what the certification, I think, tries to do also. Um, and one of the lines from the B Corp is really redefining success in business. Um, because traditionally it was always seen, obviously, from a financial perspective. Do you have any ideas that if you say, what is it, what is success in business? Because you, I hear you saying it's, it's, it might be a tr tricky, but you say it's really important to build a good business, and a business's uh, purpose is obviously to make, to make money, yeah. uh, and to be sustainably, financially, of course. But uh, is it a good business if the, the purpose is also to make impacts, and how do we measure these things? Now, if you are a good business, you just make, you try to make money. Um, if you are a good NGO, you try to change uh, behavior. If you are, so you are, uh, if you are a government, you try to create an environment in which all of this comes together without damaging, you know, at, at the low cost of high return and, 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 and welfare for people and, and the quality of life. So you have, you have a certain purpose. If you are, you choose to be a business, then you choose to, to make, make money. Um, you can't, um, yeah, be a loss-making business, or uh, you know, because uh, that—that's that, then you then you're in the wrong. You've chosen the wrong vehicle. Um, but I believe that if you do it well, um, your business, uh, and I think that is where the government comes in. If you have large um, externalities, you know, that are not costed into your product, then that's a product f problem for society, and that's something you should deal with. So I think it's up to the government to create an environment where doing bad is punished, and it actually shows up as a cost in your product. So you, you are forced to do good. Um, but as a as a business, I think the the primary thing is to you know to 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 make money, and but not to do it at cost of uh, of, of your people, of your planet, and of them. Yeah, and to, to yeah, um, we're nearing the end of our interview. I had uh, maybe an opportunity. There's lots of B Corps here, businesses here, of different kinds. Is there, uh, if you had anything or uh, advice, is always difficult. But uh, you would like to say or or uh, to the people here in this room, is there any, um, uh, yeah, anything you would like to say? Um, no, well, I think, you know, what you feel here is a very kind of warm environment. We all believe in the same purpose. And obviously there's a world out there where a lot of people do not believe the same things. And, um, I mean, recently on the radio, I heard there was someone in BNR radio, they do kind of a, as they have a, um, someone who's, do, who's developing his own uh, portfolio of shares and uh, of equity portfolio and and shell is actually keeping his uh, portfolio um, alive so in the real world um, these companies that obviously shell is doing a lot to make a change but they are still still very valuable and that, uh, and I think um, that's where the change has to happen and uh, and so also as a B Corp as you try to expand and get more companies to to uh, to join, um, do stay very open to the rest of the world and, and not become too much of a club because uh, once you're a club, you become, you, your own logic becomes dominant and once you have, your own logic is dominant, you forget about how to reach out to these other people and, and actually change the 99% of the world that is, that is out there and be very happy with yourself. And I think that's, uh, that's also something that, uh, that is a big risk to what we're doing. We, we believe that startups are so important. Well, why are they important? You have to keep asking that question. So we've set up a kind of a, a one and a half year iteration so that we, we have to reinvent ourselves every time. And I learned that from a, from a very interesting place here in Amsterdam called Freedom Lab. Every, I think, five years they, they, uh, they, they quit their lease, they cut, the, they, they destroy their credit cards and everything. They dissolve their company to rethink if this was still the right vert, uh, vehicle for actually delivering, uh, delivering on their on their mission. And it might be that they then re-rent re the same uh, building, but they might also say, we don't need a building anymore. And they felt that they couldn't reinvent themselves if they were still within all the frameworks that they had set before. So I wouldn't say that you have to be that radical, but I do think it's important to uh, not to become too much of a, of a club, because then you become also an object uh, for, the, for the other world to say, well, those, that are those guys and girls, uh, and we can di differentiate ourselves. Yeah, yeah exactly. Perfect.
Okay, so, so, so to show leadership in that sense, but to also be open and welcoming, and I think that would be the last. Uh, it is an open club, everybody is welcome, and maybe a little bit cheeky, but uh, would you, now that you know, know B Corp and are better acquainted, is it something that you would connect or introduce to the startups that you work with? Sure, sure, if it's to their benefit. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, okay, good. Well, that's a nice way to end. Thank you very much for coming today. Okay. okay.